All right. Seems we are there. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we'll now go to the second part of the lesson, Fox. So uh, in this episode, in the second part of the uh, today lesson, we're going to introduce Ross, uh, which is a set of utilities to write software on robots and to test them, right? So this is more or less the topic of the second part of the lesson. Now, normally, when you have a, 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 by building an autonomous robot, uh, the first programs, I remember the first programs that we were doing during RoboCup 1999, they were a, a huge binary blob, which was sent through floppies. And it was a single program uh, that was in charge of doing all the things that an autonomous agent has to do, which means sensing, including the dealing with the camera, with the sensors, with the lasers, which we didn't have because it was too expensive, uh, with, the, uh, with the sonars, which we had because they were cheap, and so on and so forth. So like we were elaborating this information uh, in this single program, then we were uh, estimating potentially our state out of these informations, and then uh, issuing the robot the commands, right? So there was a single program that was uh, basically having a loop that was doing all these three things, all right? I mean, the uh, problem is that uh, uh, if this was uh, sufficient for a small toy robot that has to move on, on to follow a line, then saying classical example that it's not made in school, uh, it's not, uh, well, I will prevent myself from making any joke on following a line. Um, and uh, uh, um, it turns out that if you have a system which is a little bit more articulated and useful, uh, the, the, the number of functionalities that you want to, uh, the, the system to perform increases greatly. And also the so-called behaviors, which is AI part, which is uh, uh, something that you will see in other courses. Uh, imagine, for instance, a simplistic case of a vacuum robot that starts to be already an articulated machine that needs to have a state, state meaning all what you need to remember about the past in order to uh, take actions about the future, which could be, for instance, the map of the house, which would be uh, potentially it's a vacuum cleaning robot, so the areas where it has cleaned. Maybe there are also other information that you need to estimate, like, for instance, the state of my batteries, because you have to figure out whether in order to uh, finish your task you have enough fuel to do it and you're not stuck in the middle of the room. If, if, if you are finishing your battery, then it's better that you say stop, better that I go back, I charge a bit, and then I continue here. Might be also the state of the trash bin, the, 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 the thing where, where it puts the dust. Uh, plus, uh, well, and that could be enough for a, for, a, for a robot of this sort. So, and the program that handles that might be particular, kind of articulated because we have a component which is responsible to localize, to define the position of your robot in, 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 the, in your house. Maybe another component which is responsible of estimating the map of the environment itself. There is an, another component that might be, because the robot moves in your apartment, but who tells the robot how is your apartment made? Um, you might have another component which is uh, responsible of defining the, the cleaning pattern that the system has to, has to follow, a particular Roomba if you would, would see one of the fancy Roomba that are there, it follows, it cleans the house like by doing a pattern which is, uh, you know, going up, move a little bit to the right, going down, move a little bit to the right, right, go down, and so on. And in this way, it basically cleans uh, the, the house in stripes. But then at the very end, when it has spanned the whole perimeter, then it starts to, it performs another route, which is all following all the perimeter of the room with this little, you know, um, fan to clean the potential dust that it's accumulated in the corners, right? So that's an articulated behavior. I mean, imagine uh, uh, a more complicated case as a, as a car, and, and there are a lot of functionalities that have to be uh, fulfilled by this system at all time. And not all fun functionalities are equally, uh, let's say, very critical, because there are functionalities that are less critical, uh, in a sense that uh, if they don't function perfectly, they are more heuristic than, uh, okay, maybe there is a little bit uh, a room which, which is a little bit more, more dirty, maybe this corner is not perfectly clean, and there are functionalities which are more critical. For instance, uh, uh, you don't want the robot to go down the stairs, otherwise it can get destroyed. Right. 
So they, they might have different priorities. Now, uh, coding all this everything into a unique program starts, might, be, might be impractical, even if from the energy point of view might be the most efficient thing to do because uh, you have less uh, stuff, but it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, impractical. At the same time, so what you would like to do is to enforce modularity. Also, imagine that there is a module that crashes because uh, maybe, like, you know, as all places, companies, they have uh, different employees. They need to feed all these different employees, and then they are the more skilled employees, the more reliable ones, and the less skilled employees. But they all need to, you know, once you're hired, especially in Italy, you're hired. And, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, they need to find a, a, a job, and so like, they give those you know, some less critical tasks uh, that if they crash, you know, nothing dramatic happens. This is just like a consideration about the company. Uh, anyway, uh, we don't want that in doing the monolith, so this unique program, a mistake of, of, of one, let's say, less skilled programmer, maybe a new entry, compromises the entire system, right? So, and, and imagine that this uh, scenario that I've depicted you, uh, the case of uh, the cleaning robot, that the small one that can't make you understand. Uh, yeah, this is what we don't want to happen. Most of the cases, uh, and this is not even the worst, something like that happens. Like what would have been done wrong? Maybe the sensing failed and told the car, hey, you're fine, you're, you're standing, you're standing still, you're standing still. And the car says, but I want to move forward. And so you say to the car, hey, uh, push, push the gas. Oh, but I'm not moving because the sensing tells you, hey, I'm standing still. And then you push more gas, and then you push more gas, and then you know, crash the car. So the perfect way to crash the system is to interact uh, with, with the sensing part. Now, in an ideal robotic system, uh, what you would do to encapsulate the different functionalities into modules that uh, if, uh, first of all, they should be monitoring each other. And this is uh, typically happening also inside the software that runs inside the cars. There are continuous signals and keep alive signals that are sent by the different modules to monitor their status. Because if something goes wrong, then you touch them, right? But assuming that all, each of these modules is, works more or less, what we would like to have is that if a process crashes, it can be restarted like uh, in the small, smallest time possible. This is the first thing. And this is the reason why I was mentioning before that you shouldn't be having dynamic memory allocation. Because if everything is static in a program, then you could just like revive the binary, like restart the execution, and then maybe you can have a, a working situation, maybe cleaning a little bit the state, and you restart from the previous, previous configuration, the last good configuration. Uh, but ideally, in, in designing a system, what we would like to have is to have uh, our system divided into processes, right? A process is a running program that runs on its own. No, it's different from a thread that shares memory. A process is a program that stays on its own and doesn't share memory with other things, okay? So if this process crashes, well, it's a process that crashed. I can restart that one process without other ones to do uh, bad things like it's a book. Uh, and uh, uh, another thing would be, imagine that uh, you have a running system, you are deploying a warehouse uh, of, of uh, sorry, robots working in a warehouse, right? And then there is a, a, an over-the-air update. You want to say, okay, now, you, want, you know what? I want to replace the localization module of all my systems. What you could do is to simply, instead of stopping the warehouse, and so you lose money, you could simply say, okay, now for a second, I stop for a second the, the, the localization module of all the systems, and then I change it, and I restart the localization module. Maybe the warehouse was stopping for a second, but all the remaining part of the system was not lost, because each robot maybe had this already, already its own command. Hey, bring this good to the shelf number seven, this is not responsible of the localization module that has to say where the robot is in the warehouse, right? You replace the localization module, and when it comes alive, then the, the system can run it, okay? This is another thing you could do. So, uh, the, what is typically done is to decouple the modules, of, but of course, all these programs, they have to communicate. 
because the output of a module might be used by another module. As, as in this example, the module that was in charge of localization, so of determining the position of the robot in the environment, has to product, produce an estimate about such a location that then is then used by another module that is the one in charge of making the robot following a path, right? No? And so, like, they, they need to communicate, they need to talk to each other. And this is typically done through some mechanism of inter-process communication. So, uh, in the good old times, and we're talking about already the 2000, but also 95, it's not that these things are super, super uh, new, uh, the people started to isolate the different functionalities of the system in relatively small blocks, which is, uh, like, I would say, a normal, good behavior of uh, a software engineer. You don't want to have too much complexity, uh, you know, crowded together in one single model. So people started to, to uh, this is not lead blinker, it's lead blinker. Sorry. No? Yes. Lead blinker. Lead blinker. Lead blinker. This is a metal lead. Il lampeggiatore di piombo. Okay, right, then they, so they started to um, encapsulate functionalities into, into little parts, which is very, very convenient. So they had a process that was in charge of, for instance, reading the camera. And so you have seen the pain that I was having with OBS while starting the thing because the camera was not functioning, right? Imagine that I could have just started OBS on its own, so the streaming program that I'm using, and then have started a, a little node that was trying to, to, to restart the camera. And each time I did that, I wouldn't have had to reconfigure OBS more once again and once again and once again. I would have just acted on the camera node itself. Okay? This would have been practical for me. But it's not the case. So, uh, but imagine that you function, you isolate the different functionalities into mo modules that have a very specific uh, task. And, uh, uh, and then uh, these modules, they typically communicate, as I said, through IPC. For instance, a camera reader would be a module that uh, outputs images, no? the current image that I capture from my camera. It might also take as input commands, for instance, the exposure time that controls the bri brightness of the camera at the expense of the blur, or, or, or the gain that controls the, the, the uh, brightness of the image at the expense of the quality of the image. So you could, you could tell the camera, hey, enhance, increase the brightness, and, and then you get the images back. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, but then the question is like, how do you get the data out of a module? So how, what do these modules share? They could share, they could, could communicate in two ways, as normal programs. They could communicate by sending messages. So each time I observe, I sense a camera message, I, uh, an image, I send a message to the network, to all those that are interested, say, hey, I have a new camera image, take it. No? And whoever is interested takes this camera image and then does some calculation on it. Make it way number one. Cost, I have to take a message, copy it, and potentially send it over the network, or if it's on the same machine, send it to the system through IPC or some local mechanism. Other mechanism is shared memory. So what can I do? I can, uh, I am the camera module, I can allocate a, a shared memory region, maybe a circular buffer where I'm gonna put the images as long as I read them, and then I can send also a message saying, hey, I made an image and it's now in position seven of the buffer. Then a module that is in, uh, respond, uh, interested in getting this image goes there and fetches this data from that region, and there are no copies involved in the game because it's there, right? They have pros and contra. Nowadays, basically, they, they, there's a lot of network and, and, uh, and stuff. And uh, uh, let's say this way, the, the tendency has been for a long time to go over messages. In the, in the past, when computation was more, more, more critical, people were going uh, uh, for uh, shared memory, especially for sending big amounts of data, because this doesn't involve a copy. Nowadays, people, they say, okay, with the network, by sending messages, I also profit from the fact that I can run my component on different, uh, really, computers that are connected over the network, and then they are sending messages, and this is something which is easy, okay? This is the tendency. 
Anyway, under the hood, the system can do whatever it wants it, once I define the plumbing. And then the system could leverage and then they could figure out that if the nodes are, that the programs are living on the same platform, it could negotiate in which way these messages should travel. But from, from our point of view, that's another course, or there are other courses where we can talk about how to send data on the things. I hope I will not have to teach it. Um, and and, uh, and uh, we will focus on the API and on the functionalities that we want to have. Now, now, people has converged to, uh, to, to ROS nowadays, which we will see in the next slide, but it's ROS, which stands for Robot Operating System, which is not, because the operating system under the hood is Linux, and ROS is nothing else than a pool of utilities and a message passing system for starting processes on a machine. Okay? Operating system for me, that I teach operating systems, is something new. Anyway, stands for Robot Operating System, that's the name. But it, it is the, the, the result of, of a, a gazillion of projects that have been done in the past. Carmen, to which I contributed, to OpenRDK, to which I contributed, and there was Orocos, Microsoft Robotics Studio, Play and Stage. But they were all basically providing you with the same functionalities. Carmen stands for Carnegie Mellon Navigation Tool. Uh, but why, why was ROS su successful? It was successful because it started with a critical mass. I already told the story to some of you. The game was that there was a guy from Google that, that uh, basically, uh, I don't know, either quit from Google or, or, but he was like kind of a cool guy in a sense. I think somehow the system administrator was Google, which is, I wouldn't say, uh, no, it's on the clever side, I would say. Right? And so like, he liked this idea, and so he put a lot of money on the stash, and he created this uh, Willow Garage by paying, offering 20 uh, tenured position to 20, the 20 best researchers that he could afford. They closed them in a box, and then uh, Ross was born. Because they had a, a huge critical mass, basically. No? And so, uh, and, 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 uh, and they did something like, something like Unix. Right? It was kind of, open, coherent, or they try to be coherent, and so on. Uh, uh, in the end, there's a set of tools that, that provide, uh, that, that offer you facilities to define a message. We will see in a second what it means. But define a message is uh, like defining a struct in C. Now you define the data that compose a type of message. Okay. Once you define a struct, the struct you say there should be an in called the uh, pino, a float called Gino, an array of this, whatever. And this is going to be a message. It defines a utility for process control to monitor the status of the, of the, of the different programs that are ROS linked programs. Uh, it offers, an, let's say, a meta file system, which is a file system which is living on your actual file system where you can organize nicely the different ROS programs that live in there. And it offers, more, 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 also importantly, a build system. So a way, once you have written your code, a way to compile it without getting crazy and linking all the universe of libraries that you might need to link if you uh, directly issue CMake commands for including the ROS models. And this was like basically what, what, comes, what came with ROS. It's a set of core utilities. Okay? But then uh, it was designed for a, for, a, for a big robot, the PR2, because once they wanted to do this, uh, this system, they did the system for a, for, a, for a robot, which was the most complicated uh, that they could have, because they say, if it works on such a complicated robot, any other smaller one would fit, and which was a robot with two arms, I don't know how many sensors, and whatever, it was costing, costing an improperium, and, and, uh, and that was like basically the first version of ROS. And in order to get, get it running, and that's why it gained momentum, they came by packing inside ROS a lot of utilities, a lot of little programs that were solving the most common tasks. For instance, navigation. For instance, navigation means go from A to B, mapping, uh, control of things, uh, control of a manipulator that you will be seeing with the Luca, and also linking libraries of object recognition. Their luck was they didn't want to develop the things from scratch, 
but they, they rather allow the inclusion on every sort of libraries. So everyone that had a cool library came to ROS or came to, started to uh, pack their software into a ROS wrapper, right? By doing so, it extended the visibility of its own program because all other users of ROS could, could, be, could start working with this module without needing to write any single line of code because it was already integrated into the ROS ecosystem, okay? And that was the reason why ROS became attractive because it was a way to integrate easily the things, the, the different programs. And this is a little bit of, uh, of the story. Now, okay, this was the, the, uh, the I have the prefetch of the next slide, uh, but uh, uh, this is the, the summary of what I was just saying, uh, uh, why people choose this. Well, because, well, why people, it's a big word, because it looks like that the word is populated by roboticists, but it's not that, that, that we're not that many, 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 so it's sufficient to convince, let's say, uh, 2,000 good ones, and then all others follow. And, uh, uh, but the thing is that it enforces code reuse, uh, which means uh, by doing the modules which are small enough, then uh, uh, you can just include a fun this node, and then, uh, reuse, uh, avoid the writing again the functionalities which are um, uh, embedded in the nodes. I use the word node in this conversation, just think about a node to a node uh, as if it was a process, okay? Uh, it's distributed because it uses message passing, so you could run it on different uh, uh, computers. It's la language independent for those of you that hate C++, you could also write ROS modules in Python and have fun enjoying the performance. Uh, uh, you can, uh, 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 and the understanding as well. Uh, and uh, it allows you to include any sort of library in test, and uh, it, it is well maintained, or it used to be well maintained, I don't know now, because I'm stuck to a version of a couple of years ago. Uh, now, how do I install ROS? I mean, I forced you to install Ubuntu, I think, and if you didn't do it uh, so far, you would do it. Now, especially those that use Windows Linux subsystem, okay? So, use, install Linux natively on your machine. Yeah. If, you, if someone has the ears whistling, uh, yes. Because, uh, because uh, it's easier, right? Um, if you want to run on a virtual machine with the build that we are gonna give, you have to give to the virtual machine at least four gigabyte, if not eight, okay? If you're running on a virtual machine. Uh, how to install it? Well, uh, uh, how to install ROS, I will show you how to use Google. Huh? Installing ROS. And the version that we have now, if you have Ubuntu 20.04, um, uh, the version that we have now out is Noetic, okay? Ubuntu Noetic. How to instant ROS on, huh? And then you follow the tutorial, okay? I'm sure you can do that. Okay, this is how to install ROS. Okay, that, it's, a, it's a, a couple of pages. You can also leave the comment if you want. Uh, and this is how to install ROS. I mean, this is an example. I mean, I just Googled for it, but I'm sure it works. Okay. Um, what do you have to install? ROS comes uh, prepackaged with different, uh, let's say, selection of packages. What you need to install is uh, um, ROS uh, desktop full, which is the collection of packages that comprises, so to say, all the nodes that we're gonna need uh, in this course, okay? So, your ta task for next week will be, task number one, install ROS. ROS can be installed with apt-get, sudo apt-get after setting the keys, uh, ROS noetic uh, desktop tool, like a command like that. Mm -hmm. 
but not no attic because I have uh, 18. Uh, so I'm not, uh, so you don't. Ah, so, uh, so. May load the desktop top full. Right, but I'm not gonna do it because I have my own selection here. But if you, instead of melodic, melodic is the release. You have to write here no attic if you have 2004. Okay, but I'm not gonna do it on this machine because otherwise I screw up my precious packages. Why don't you do it? Because I'm sure that it compiles uh, what you will see would compile on both things, and I don't want to destroy the system with an unattempt, with an early or a non stable upgrade. Now, what are the main concepts of ROS programs? A node is a process. <laughs> cool. A message. A message is a thing that is sent out by a node, by a process, to inform uh, someone which is listening about uh, a potential change. A message is like a variable that is thrown by a process, has two informations attached. The first information is the type of the message, the struct. You know, if I'm sending you a message of type robot position, it's different from a message of type image. Okay? So it's attached, it's a data structure, which you define and then you send out. And the message is, do you understand the difference between the definition of a type and the declaration of an instance of a type? Do you understand this difference or not? Yes, when you want, if you write a struct pino and then you start populating the fields, you are defining a type. If you, if you write uh, pino p1, you're de defining an instance of uh, the struct pino, which is called p1. It has a name. It's like the humans and pino, a human. All right? So once uh, a node runs, what happens is that uh, uh, this process produces typically a stream of messages, so a sequence of messages that inform potential interested others about its state. For instance, a camera image, a camera node could produce a stream of images. Now, each time the stream is, means sequence, each time of messages of type image, where each message uh, is the actual image gathered by the camera. Clear? A joystick could produce messages of type uh, joystick access. So no, you could attach a joystick and have a program that once you move the joystick sticks will, will repeatedly repeat obsessively and compulsively the position of the uh, sticks of the axis of the of the joystick. Okay. Now you might have that you have multiple nodes in your system that publish the same type of message. Right? Maybe you have two cameras. Let's call it camera left, and let's call it camera right. These two nodes will produce the same type of message, the same still an image message. However, how do you differentiate between the two? Well, we associate to a category of information the uh, topic. The topic is like the name of the stream. So the camera one or the camera left will output a sequence of messages that uh, that uh, go under the, the name, for instance, uh, uh, left camera. So you'll have one stream, a channel. The second camera will output the messages still of type camera image on another channel. Let's call it camera right. Okay? Is that clear? Very good. The, Final concept of ROS is service. What is a service? Well, whereas messages are something that a node publishes to whoever is interested, and it publishes it continuously, a message is like a, a, a TV transmission, or like uh, uh, me when I stream on YouTube. I just stream, but I don't expect any feedback. If there is some feedback, I rejoice, but normally I don't expect it. Uh, now, uh, a service, it's something different because it's like a remote procedure call, which means, what is a remote procedure call? What is a procedure call? You call a function, 
Once you call a function, you expect a return value. I've done it, I've not done it. Okay? Clear? And until this function is not terminated, you stop. What is a remote function call? It's a function that you call on a remote host. So you say, you say, now tell to this node to do this thing. For instance, switch off to send me the configuration. And then you wait until get configuration. You wait until you don't get the configuration. This is a service. Is that clear the difference between nodes, messages, topics, and services? Now, let's look at them um, uh, like a little bit more in detail as always. Nodes. What is a node? It's a running instance of a program, pro, of, a, of a ROS program. What, it, what, what makes a program a ROS program? The fact that it's, it's linked against the ROS library. Makes it a ROS program. It's a main, that's a ROS program. Nodes are designed to be modular and fine-grained, right? Of course, the, you have to pay a trade-off here, because if you make your nodes too little, then basically your system is going to you, you incur in the communication overhead, which is substantial, because every time you want to do something, you're going to flood the network with a gazillion of messages. So I would take it with, the, with a pinprick, with, the, uh, with care. What, what, what does a node do in his life? A node produces, potentially, information that can be used by other nodes or uses information produced by other nodes. And it does so in a publish-subscribe way. Do you know what is a publish-subscribe way? What is paradigm? Very good. Publish-subscribe subscribe is what you do when you subscribe to my channel on YouTube. When you subscribe on my channel on YouTube, you basically, I think, I don't know because I'm not subscribed to anything, I hate these things, but yeah, for someone that subscribes to the notifications of, of, of Pemponio, whatever, uh, on, on this, uh, what you get is you get a message, right? Every time I, I, I start streaming something, you will get a message. So, no, you subscribe to a message, and then you get notified when I send this particular message. Is that clear? That's a publish subscribe. So what does it do you need to implement an API for public subscribe? You need, to need, you need to have a way to specify what is the topic, which means the sequence of information to which you are uh, interested. And then you need also to specify potentially a callback, which is a function which is invoked every time you receive a message on that, every time I'm streaming, every time you receive a message on that topic. All right. I mean, similarly, a note, uh, like this is on the subscriber side, but that's also on the publisher side. The publisher side should, every time it produces the content, it needs to publish it to whoever is interested. It's not that the publisher needs to know who is listening to him. The publisher publishes. All right. Notes are written either in, in C++ by using ROS CPP or ROS PI. Messages. Nodes communicate with each other, as I say, by passing messages. A message is this data structure, which is defined of, of typed fields. It's like a struct, guys. Only that the language to specify it is slightly different, but it's a struct. Okay? So, in case, if you want to define an image message, what would you need to have in today's this image? Well, you need to have the width of the image, an integer, the height of an image, the number of, of rows, you need to have uh, the, the, the pixel format, for instance. So uh, am I sending an image which is RGB? For, and then for each pixel, I will need three bytes. Or am I sending an image which is monochrome? And then for each pixel, I will need one byte right? format. And then you might also need a byte array. So an array where you store, where you send actually the content of the pixels of the image one. Uh, or if you're sending a robot position, you might need uh, x, y, theta if you live in the plane. So three floats. And that's another type of message. Messages can be nested, similar to the structure. So you can have a message, which is data structure, that inside contains another message. Or another type, right? Okay, you can have a nested structure in, structures in C. You can have nested, nested structure in the ROS ecosystem. Topics. A topic is attached to a message. A topic is something which is published, okay? So it's like a YouTube channel. 
<coughs> is something which is published. And uh, how do you identify this, this topic it's into the Ross ecosystem with a string, which of course needs to be not necessarily unique, uh, that it, but uniquely identify that particular topic. You might have also two publishers that publish on the same topic. For instance, before me and, uh, and um, Emanuele, we are publishing on my YouTube channel, the same one. Right? Because the topic was the same. You can, you can have two publishers that publish on the same topic. No? Because the topic is identified by a string. But it's not that we're going to use it uh, uh, or abuse it. The point is that the topic is identified to a string. It's identified to a string and is attached to a type. No? Once you, you have a topic, this channel will not... So will produce images. This channel will produce robot positions. So a topic is uniquely attached to a type. Uh, a no node interested in a topic can subscribe to it. Obviously, there will be a function call that registers this topic and, uh, and specifies the call. <coughs> and more importantly, the production of the information and the consumption are decoupled, which means that uh, you, pro you publish as a node an information, but you don't care on whether the uh, you have, sub you have subscribers, right? You publish it a little bit what I do sometimes when I give lessons from home when I see zero subscribers, right? Not on this course. Uh, zero watchers. All right. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, 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 a topic. Another concept, so I, I'm, I'm sorry for those that have already seen these things, but I have to tell them to, the, to everyone. Another, uh, so, so far everything clear, everything logical, I guess. Another concept are services, as I mentioned. Now, what, what are the minimal information that I need to call a function? The first thing that I need to call a function is the function name. Then I need to know the function arguments, what I need to give to this function. And the last thing that I need to know is the function return type, right? Uh, and that's exactly the way you define services. To define a service, you, in fact, have to define a data structure which will contain both the arguments of a function and the type of the response of this function. Is that clear? So you have to define the prototype of the functions. And also, another thing that you will have to define inside your node, if you want to install a service, so to be a provider of a remote function call, you will have to say, to the system, A, hey, please, each time this particular function is called, how do you, do you identify the, the, the function? By name, a string. Each time this particular function is called, please pack the arguments uh, as they are and execute this my own function. So you have to install a callback. Do you know what a callback is? No. Okay. A callback is a function that is called by an external uh, caller. In, an example of callback is the interrupt. The interrupt is an asynchronous function that's called by, your, by, 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 by the CPU. So the interrupt handler is not that you say, now I call it interrupt handler. No, you don't call it. It's an external event that triggers the interrupt handler. A callback is callback. No, so you receive the input and then you react. Installing a callback is equivalent to install an interrupt handler. handler. Is that clear? You bind it to the, to the specific event. For instance, one event could be I receive a message of this type on this topic and then do this. Another event would be I receive a service request and then programmatically you'll have to say, okay, once I receive the service request, I receive the arguments, I have to, I read them and then you pass this to a C function that has to be evaluated, returns the value and then you send it back. Ross takes care of sending back the result. Is that clear? So this is an example on how to declare inside the, 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 the functions. We will see it a little bit better. A service, this is a service that takes a couple of integers at 64 bits and produces another integer at 64 bits. By looking at the names, I could imagine, I could envision that the service which obeys to this particular formatting performs the sum of A and B, okay? Calling a service results as is in behavior similar to calling a function, only that it's not executed here, it's executed by someone else, and then the result is sent back to me. 
No. Uh, what about the communication scheme? So all these uh, programs, they typically communicate over the network. They also can communicate locally, but just for now think that they communicate over the network, even on the local machine. Uh, when, when you bring up uh, the, the nodes, uh, there is a special program that you have to start once in the system, which is called ROSCORE. ROSCORE is like a broker, a communication broker. A guy, a program that you don't have, you have just to start it, that stays there and sleeps. And then each time a, ROS, a program, which is a ROS node, which is linked against the ROS library, wakes up, contacts the master. Hey, master, I'm here. The master says, who are you? And then the, the node tells his name. Hey, I'm Pino. All right, you are the node Pino. And then it, the ROS master notes that there is an, a node called Pino in the, in the pool. Uh, and then uh, another node comes. This node ca oh, then Pino dies. Once it dies, Pino sends a message to, to Ros Roscore and says, hey, I am dead. And Roscore notifies that this object is there. Okay? First thing. Wh why do you need the core? You need the core in the actual version of ROS to keep track of the communication because the core takes care of, for each node, for each node, for each program, what are the types of information that is produced by this node. Okay, a node is a process. So you have a localization, you have a camera program, a camera whatever, listener, camera driver that reads from, from the camera, from, from the kernel, and, and, and then publishes images, right? And then uh, this node is uh, called the left camera. It may be it published the topic left camera image, right? What happens in the interaction schema on bring up is that this information are sent to the core. The core writes down, okay, there is in the system a node, which is called, uh, how it was called, that produces the topic left camera image. Okay? Clear? And then it keeps track of it, bookkeeping. Another node wakes up and says, hey, I am the uh, camera recorder. And what do you need? I need, uh, I need, I do require to have a left camera image as an input topic. At this point, the, the, the core that takes care of these things creates a binding, says, okay, this process here produces an information that this other process needs. So there will be a handshaking, and then after a while, the, the process, uh, each time the camera produces that information, the other one will, uh, will gather it. So the ROS master, ROS core, is the, is, the, is the master. The communication at the beginning happens to the core because it has to act as sort of DNS. It has to keep the global tables of the system. But once uh, a connection is established, so I have two nodes that, that uh, one produces what the other one wants, the core, it's, uh, the, the two nodes communicate directly. Okay? Which means that if you are deploying a, multi a complicated system that has to run on multiple computers, well, it's not completely stupid, the idea of putting, of clustering the nodes, the programs that share a lot of information on the same machine. Because uh, at the beginning, each of them will communicate with the master. But then at runtime, like when, when the messages start flowing, the nodes that live on the same machine will not, not have to trap over the network and so they will consume resources. Okay, is that clear? Now, what are tools? We have plenty of command line tools that now I will demonstrate. Uh, we have tools for displaying uh, messages of specific type. Uh, there are links in this, in this slide, so you have uh, plenty. What I was uh, mentioning before about the ROS core, it, this is one of these programs, and it's a program that you have to start at the beginning. How do you start ROS core? Now, I will do a demonstration on how to start ROS core. This is how to start Roscoe. Okay, after you have installed ROS, following the guides on YouTube. Okay, Roscoe, in fact, is a little. It has a little bit more things. There's another stuff that you typically need uh, once running a complicated uh, program, which is the parameters. Well, if you have 20 computers which are implementing your robotic system, a problem of where to put the configuration files starts to be felt. Also because maybe sometimes you might decide to run a, a program on one computer and some other time you need to run this program on another computer. 
or maybe you want to change some parameter at runtime. One example of, example of the parameter might be the map of your system that if updated, you want to change the map on all the modules that are using it. So the core also implements the functionality of parameter server, which means that you can set parameters to the core and then each module that requires to know the value of a certain parameter will ask it to the core. Okay? So you don't need to write or distribute the parameters uh, over the network in, in configuration files or so. Uh, the concept of a parameter is kind of, kind of what is a parameter? Is a, is, a, is a thing, which is a, a, a pair. The parameter has a name and has a value, right? The name is a string, and the value can be integer, float, double, is a primitive type. Now, uh, to, once you have brought up the, the ecosystem, please, 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 and please, remember that the ROS programs that you compile in C++ are C++ programs, okay? So there is a binary which is attached to that. It's not that you start doing ROS run and magic. Once you build the system, there is somewhere a binary that if you look into it, is a fantastic elf. And you can start it with a command line without doing all the macumba of determining things. It's a binary. If it's Python, I don't know and I don't want to know. Uh, but given that ROS uses a, a peculiar structure of uh, organizing the files, and in order to find exactly where is your binary, you can say, run this binary, uh, run this uh, uh, binary produced by this package, because the concept is that you aggregate the functionalities in blocks, which are called packages. Uh, these are some utilities. ROS run is a shell utility that starts a, a program in particular. Where is the mouse? Yeah starts a program, in particular this will start from a certain package, a certain executable. I will make now examples of all those. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, uh, oh, I don't have it. Do I have it or not? Well, I have it, otherwise I wouldn't be able to do a score. Uh, Program. Ah, see, sì. uh, robot. Uh, mm. uh, now we will have also. CD. Now, what I've done in this particular thing is that I source a workspace. Uh, we will see it in the build system in a second. Normally, once you have a large project, what you do is that you organize all your programs into a directory that you call your workspace. You might have multiple workspaces for your projects. Okay? Now, in this folder, I have the workspaces of a former course that I was teaching, which was called the Labiaggi, which... Uh, is strongly inherited from here. The folder of this project contains uh, a directory which is called source. In source, I have all subdirectories. Each subdirectory will contain, right, the different packages, the different uh, module blocks that con construct my application. Agreed? Clear? I have a folder with all the mondets inside. In particular, there is a directory which is called source, which which contain the sources. All other directories are generated by the system itself, by the build system. Now, uh, I don't know, there was navigation. Uh, uh, no. Wait, configs, I do not have configs. I want, ah, config. All right. Uh, I have the core running. Do I have it? No, I had it running already because you can have only one instance. Now I'm starting one program. Which program am I starting? I'm starting a special program which is the simulator 
The simulator allows me, for instance, to provide a synthetic map that I might have acquired with a real robot to my system and uh, to put on this map a, physic a physical platform in a specific location and then to, this platform will behave as if it was a, a true robot in this simulated world. The simulator that you have with the ROS desktop full, and if you don't have it, you can get it with sudo up, get installed a certain string that you will discover, is stage. Now I will run stage, which is the simulator, on this environment. Okay, guys? How do I run stage? Where is stage? I don't know it. But I can ask ROS, can you tell me the packages? List. And these are all the packages, ROS pack, list. And these are all the packages that are now populating my, <coughs> my, uh, my workspace. Okay? They are plenty. In particular, one of these workspace uh, packages will be called stage. Stage ROS. Stage ROS. It's called stage ROS. Start completion works. I, this is the simulator. I have to start a simulator, which is a ROS node. It's a program that encapsulates a simulator that produces topics. What are the topics? The topics that the sensor, the, the, the virtual robot on my simulated environment um, uh, produces. So if I have a laser, this simulator will produce the topic of the laser as if it was mounted on this fake robot. If I have, a, a, if, the rob if I can steer the robot, I could send a velocity command to the robot, which will subscribe to this topic, and there will be a comma, bell, thing, whatever. Okay, so that will be. Now I'm starting this program by using, if you remember well, the, here, here, here. Okay, starting a node. The command ROS run. ROS run package name. I will try to zoom, but it's not cooperative. No? No, the mouse works well today, eh? Hmm? No, a rodella va bomba. Viev, zoom in. No, I know it. <laughs> that was it. Uh, I will start using this. And what I will be running, I will be running the simulator. Okay, ROS run, package name, stage ROS, executable stage ROS. Tab completion works, OBS die. Where was it? Yeah. Stage ROS, and then I need clearly a, a, a synthetic word. What was a Carpero Diag, uh, uh, one Diag uh, word. Carpero Laser one Diag word. Yes, this is a word file. And then I have the simulator running. This is the simulator, ladies and gentlemen. Made, uh, I invite you to think about how fast is the entire process and how slow it is on a virtual machine. Okay? It's true that this machine is capable, but it's also true that, uh, yeah, there might be a difference. All right, and this is my simulator, where I have a funky robot that I can move around. Okay? Now, what happened in terms of topics, right? We have started a node. This node is producing and consuming topics. How can I figure out which topics, what, what's going on in my, in my, my work? Well, I could start a program which is called, show me the top, which, which is called RQT graph. RQT graph. Remember, package name, node name, I have one single node in the system, which is called state ROS. Obviously, I started one node, I have one idiot. Okay? Very good. I leave it here and I make it small and cute. No, nothing. Ah. Ooh. The control. What's the control thing? All right. Now, another thing I could do now when I started the simulator, let's start another program. Where is the joystick? In Chavez and joystick. No. There's no joystick, so I will. I will. Uh, oh, another thing that I may, might be interested. Okay, of course I can use this loud utility, and I can uh, ask uh, to show me uh, topics. Must be. I, I'm not good with GUI. Yes. 
leaf topics, I can see that stage ROS requires a topic which is called CMD belt, right? By doing this. But I can also do another thing from shell, which I prefer. ROS topic list. A ROS topic is a command for asking the system, hey, what are the topics in the game? List is a subcommand of the command. ROS topic is a binary. That basically, what is ROS topic doing? It calls the master, hey master, what are the topics in the game? And the master tells him, hey, these are the topics in the game. And these are the topics which are actually produced. There's a topic which is called base can, a topic which is called clock, cmdvel, which is presumably a topic which is requested, an input topic, then there is all sorts of things. I can also show the topic. With echo, you attach to a topic and you display right, the messages that are flowing. Let's, let me ask the odometry. The odometry is the position of the robot. Okay? Okay, and this is the position of the robot. I mean, well, believe me, the robot is not moving. So, like, this is the position of my robot minus three, minus 13, and whatever. What happens if I change it uh, a little bit? What is it? Yeah, you see that ch this number changed? Okay, I mean, I, I, it has more information that, that, that you need. It has a position, it has an orientation expressed in three dimensions. There is a 12 uh, uh, thingies covariance, and I think uh, we have to go. We will continue this fantastic Ross adventure in the next episode. Okay, sorry for the streaming thing. Uh, and uh, the, the menu, the lesson for the next uh, episode will be, we will finish Ross. Please, please, please. Come with ROS installed natively on your machines. Okay? Otherwise, uh, <laughs>